And I can recall I marched down Market Street here in San Francisco handing out condoms, being astounded at how many people were taking the condoms but in jest and blowing them up and popping them and having a wonderful time and not taking the message seriously. With over 300 dead, the joke was rapidly wearing thin. There was no question that we're talking about a major epidemic. What was remarkable was that when you got this disease, it looked like everybody died, and we never had a disease like that. The cause appeared to be something in the blood, but scientists were baffled as to what. January 4th, 1983, blood suppliers from all over the country came to address the problem. One CDC expert pounded the table and pleaded, how many people have to die before something is done? It was an emotionally charged meeting. The doctor added, if you do nothing, it will be negligent homicide. But the blood banks didn't agree. There were people who said we should do something, and there were others who said, what? We have no idea what to do. The answer, when it came, was worse than anyone had guessed. Kampala, Uganda. At the end of 1982, Dr. Sam Okwari at the Ministry of Health received a disturbing letter. It said that something strange was happening in a remote trading post on the shores of Lake Victoria. Okwari decided to investigate. I knew that this was a very difficult area, so I decided to take a four-wheel drive, uh, reached Masaka, and started going towards this place, which was quite remote. We started going into potholes, swamps. At one point, we almost got stuck. Okware drove for an uncomfortable four hours. He was heading for Kasensero, a place from where traders would set off to Tanzania, Kenya, and Rwanda. Suddenly we saw the lake, and there were very many people there enjoying themselves. There was beer, there was whiskey, there was everything. I was amazed. I mean, there was so much life going on. There was so much trade, there was so much smuggling, there were a lot of people carrying goods. It was virtually like a paradise for, shall I say, for smugglers and uh, that type of businessmen. It was about as far as you could get from the sophisticated cities where AIDS had first surfaced. There was no school there, there was no roads, there was nothing completely, and there, there seemed to be no infrastructure for anything, even for keeping law and order. We went into some of the houses uh, to see what had actually happened and also to see the patients. The clinical symptoms were rather different from anything I'd seen before. They were very much wasted. The patients were actually dry. In fact, I remember there was one particular boy whom I saw and he had been completely drained to the bone because of chronic diarrhea which he had been having for a number of months. There was a lot of agony on his face and really the situation was quite pathetic. The men too had very aggressive Kaposi sarcoma. But I think at the end of the day, they all had one condition. There was total apathy in their faces and very, very, very hopeless. We were amazed to find that the only people who were infected in the house were the sexual partners. None of the children were infected, none of the aunties, none of the other relatives in the house were infected. 
Above the lake was an eccentric house built by a self-styled doctor called Henry Masoki. He'd picked up his medicine from a nurse while working as a tailor in Entebbe. That patient, back in 1976, was probably the first case of AIDS in Uganda. Dr. Masoki explained what he'd done to try and help him. He had checked Giordano over thoroughly, tested his blood, and given him the appropriate medicines and injections for his complaints. Nothing had worked. Giordano's house now lies empty. His wife had died soon afterwards. Even at the time, people thought there was something mysterious about the deaths. At one time, it was believed that uh, some of these people died because of witchcraft, because it was believed that they had cheated their friends during the course of their vices on the lake. Sam Aquare followed the trail. Later, he would discover how the mystery disease made its way along the dirt roads until it reached Uganda's main truck route. The focus of the disease soon turned out to be the places where the truckers spent the night. Because the disease is sexually transmitted, obviously when they came with money, came with the goods, uh, they picked up most of the girls in town and uh, naturally they were the first ones to be infected and, um, and they're also the first ones to infect others. Basically that's how the disease came to Chotera. Chotera was the first link in that fatal trail. The nearest small town to the lakeside trading post where Aquare's search had begun. As the goods travelled from Chotera to Masaka to Kampala to Jinja and so on, uh, most of these drivers also carried with them the infection as well as the goods. Sam Aquare returned to Kampala, baffled. I brought back some samples which were analysed and the samples suggested that there was some typhoid and tuberculosis among some of these patients. And most of the patients who should have responded, who should have responded to typhoid treatment and tuberculosis treatment, most of these patients died. In Paris, Jacques Leibovitch had already seen two patients from Africa who died with their immune system shattered. Then he read an article about the new gay disease in America. I immediately and all my colleagues recognized the same disease. So we called each other right on the spot. It was somehow exotic. It obviously had a focus for us, known to us in Africa that the Americans didn't know of. In America, Work on AIDS was just getting underway at the vast National Institutes of Health outside Washington. One of its labs was run by a mercurial Italian-American called Robert Gallo. Gallo had recently become something of a scientific star. His great discovery was a human retrovirus. That's a sort of virus which burrows into the body's own genetic code and then starts reproducing itself in what are called the T-cells of the immune system. Gallo's virus, which he called HTLV, caused a type of leukemia. Now he wondered whether it might be linked to AIDS. I began thinking that AIDS might be due to a retrovirus because, well, our lab was working on human retroviruses, the leukemia virus HTLV-1, the leukemia virus HTLV-2, and we had quite a bit of expertise on the biology of the T cell. This theory appeared in an article in the winter of 1982, and that article was read in Paris by Jacques Leibovitch. And that's where it struck me. Of course, it had to be a retrovirus. And when that happened to me. I was thunderstruck. I called Robert Gallo, who didn't know me. He had this strong, low voice and said, all right, what do you have? What do you want? I don't remember the details of the telephone call. I remember vividly his visit to our laboratory and his excitement. He knew this laboratory was working on AIDS with one finger. 
you know, we still had our, a lot of cancer research going on, and how important was AIDS? I didn't know. We work a little bit. We work a little bit more. I think Leibovich was uh, trying to light a fire here to say, really, uh, get involved. So he, he also was a catalyst. In exchange, he gave me some preliminary information that was supportive of the retrovirus hypothesis, which I conveyed back to France. The Pasteur Institute still basks in the reflected glory of the man who discovered penicillin. It hadn't shown much interest in AIDS until Leibovitch and some colleagues persuaded its rather cautious boss, Luc Montagné, to organize a retrovirus test on a sample from one of their AIDS patients. We had some phone calls uh, at the end of December 1982 uh, about uh, the possibility to look for retrovirus in uh, samples of patients with AIDS. And so uh, there will be a biopsy uh, on January 4. And so a small piece of lymph node was taken from the neck of a young man dying of AIDS and carried from one side of Paris to the other. The journey was a giant leap for French science, though the messenger found the Pasteur somewhat unprepared. If she could find anybody in my lab, anybody was going for lunch. I was not there, I was at the course. And uh, she went to the other lab. She didn't find anybody either. It finally came to rest in the laboratory of Claude Sherman and Françoise Barry Senoussi. Françoise had learned how to track down a retrovirus at Gallo's lab in Washington. His technique involved waiting several weeks to give the cells a chance to multiply. But her curiosity with this culture made her check it much sooner. Since uh, we did not really know what we were looking for, we decided to look every two or three days if it was something coming out from the cells. After three weeks' work in the labs, she found the unique telltale sign of a retrovirus the presence in the sample fluid of an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Around 26th of January, we had the first sign of a reverse transcriptase activity in the fluid. But then she noticed something that shouldn't be happening with the retrovirus. Instead of multiplying, the cells were dying. Since the cells were dying, the virus was disappearing at the same time. So we say, my God, uh, we had something and we are losing these things. Back in Washington, Gallo's team were also hunting for a retrovirus in tissue samples from AIDS patients. Their whole procedure was based on the assumption that it would behave like HTLV. It's going very slow, no? You work hard, she works hard, everybody works, but it goes so slow. Oh, okay. you, you know, maybe you're waiting too long for variants to come up. I think in, in his mind, he was really convinced at that time that it was somewhere HTLV related. But I think it is the reason why when they were looking for the virus, they were waiting for several weeks. And it's the reason also why they could not detect the virus, because the virus was killing the cells. So looking after several weeks, it was no more virus in culture. It's no doubt there was an overconfidence in the, and a feeling that, every, you know, what we think is going to be right, you know, it's, uh, there was too much confidence. Back in Paris, they compared what they had found with a sample of HTLV. They were convinced it was different. We had the first sign that our virus was different from his virus. And I think that was the most exciting time. I went home and uh, I told my husband, oh, I think we have really something very important in the lab. We arrived to this dinner very, very excited and started to speak uh, and to be really noisy all night. It was important to know whether it was a known retrovirus or a new retrovirus. So the second excitement excitement came when we got some results showing that it was really a new retrovirus. Montagne hurried into print. As a helpful gesture, Gallo agreed to act as a referee for his article. 
we were really rushing and we forget to do the summary. And we sent to Bob Gallo and uh, he wrote the abstract for us. But Gallo added something extra in the summary. He said that the French virus was probably in the HTLV family. In other words, not entirely new. The French data, when it appeared in the May edition of Science magazine, was by no means conclusive and their paper was largely ignored. People seemed much more impressed by three other papers, two by Gallo himself, which continued to push the connection with HTLV, the human T-cell leukemia virus. You couldn't call that virus the AIDS virus in 1983, but it was novel. It was a new kind of virus. Whether or not it belonged to the HTLV family or not doesn't take any credit away or give more credit. And the data in that paper, it's easy to summarize what they published. Certainly to me, any logical person who knew the field would, would have concluded this is not going to be a whole new family of retroviruses. The next round in the battle was fought out on Long Island, New York. In the conference center at Cold Springs Harbor, top scientists gathered to discuss the latest advances. Gallo and Montagnier smiled for the camera, but not for long. Montagnier had arrived with fresh evidence to suggest his team had discovered the virus which caused AIDS, and he was expecting his audience to take serious notice. He couldn't have been more wrong. I must say I was very disappointed. I was expecting a much more uh, warm reception. But Montagnier spoke in halting English. Gallo was still the star turn. I was uh, not uh, flambou flamboyant like Gallo, and uh, when I say something in, in, in lecture, in uh, meetings, uh, people do not listen to, to me than they are listening to, to him. Uh, I think I made some uh, <laughs> uh, progress on that. But uh, it's clear also that the fact we were from Europe, from France, reduced the impact of our discoveries. One of the people listening was Don Francis, the government scientist with the job of working out how to control the spread of AIDS. Bob Gallo stood up afterwards and just lambasted him for uh, having nothing. He said, that's nonsense. And it was really very, very abusive of Dr. Montagnier. In his uh, acid tongue, uh, clearly fluid, in English, uh, he uh, uh, kind of stunned uh, poor Montagnier. It was not a fair battle. Luc Montagnier is very straight and uh, cautious, very conservative. Standing up to Bob Gallo is a difficult thing to do. He is a huge force in the field because of the money that surrounded National Cancer Institute. It was really remarkable work on human retrovirology. And so to look to him for leadership was appropriate. There is a point that is sometimes forgotten. Cold Spring Harbor is a place of more give and take. And in the United States, it's a little more that way than perhaps there, there is in uh, continental Europe. And so it's a place we normally have uh, pretty heavy interactions and not worried so much about the manners and the feelings of people. Uh, however, knowing he was from abroad and um, knowing that that talk was a good talk, I wish I could have lived that moment over. <laughs> In Gallo's lab, efforts intensified to prove that the virus was HTLV. Later, some claimed this delayed progress towards the vital test which would protect people from infected blood. That's an interesting question of whether or not my enthusiasm for the first human retrovirus has delayed or distorted our research. Without the HTLV research, it's doubtful that any of us would be on this television program now talking about the quick progress in those early years. There is no question that the early work on HCLVs set up the notion, one, to look for a retrovirus, two, helped, it wasn't the sole thing, but helped with the technology because it was looking for those viruses that gave us technology to grow T cells. People forget that. Delay, give me an example. Anyone give an example of where it could have delayed is utter nonsense.
This is downtown Los Angeles before dawn. The streets seem littered with cardboard cartons, but underneath each carton sleeps a person who must move his shelter before it's swept up as the city comes to life. It's in just such areas all over the country that the indigent can go to sell their plasma. They sell their collections to the major processors. In the United States, unlike Britain, blood is donated for money. An added attraction is the free hot dog. The blood banks argued there was no way to test donors for contamination until scientists had nailed the virus. There was a tremendous inertia of that group to accept the basic premise that we had a blood transmissible agent, and yet the writing was on the wall. This was a new field for us. We did not understand that you could get something, harbor it for years, and then get infected with clinical disease. Dr. Marcus Conant was treating many AIDS patients early in 83. He was alarmed at the blood banks in action. They were concerned about the cost. This is going to cost us more to prepare the blood because we are going to have to take more time. We're going to have to screen it. They were afraid they were going to lose donors. They thought that this disease AIDS represented so few people and that they were going to have to tell large numbers of people, please don't come and give blood. At that stage, the blood banks knew that five hemophiliacs and six people who'd had transfusions had already gone down with AIDS. There was strong evidence that it was caused by a virus in the blood, but there was no positive proof. The blood banks insisted that there was therefore no reason to change their basic procedures. They told us as physicians it was safe. I chaired committees where they sat there and reassured us that there was one in a million chances. An internal blood bank paper from this period suggested a task force should be mounted to provide a delaying tactic. It went on, we do not want anything we do to be interpreted by society or the legal authorities as agreeing that AIDS could be spread by blood. The most we can do is buy time, though there is little doubt that additional transfusion and haemophilia cases will surface. It was signed by the chairman of the American Association of Blood Banks. In this letter, Dr. Bovey says there's no uh, doubt in his mind that they will see other cases of transfusion-associated AIDS. We must be very careful, we blood bankers, to keep the lawyers off of our back. But if we all stick together, we should come through this just fine. One thing the banks were asked to do was not to take blood from anyone in a high-risk group. The banks said no. It wasn't fair to ask whether someone was homosexual. Now, we knew in 1983 that 75% of all the cases of AIDS in the United States were amongst gay men. And we also knew that in San Francisco, most gay men would tell you, particularly in a doctor's office in private, if you just asked them, that yes, they were gay. They weren't ashamed of it. And the blood bankers got all confused about where, whose civil rights we're talking about here. If we ask men if they are gay, are we not violating their privacy? Well, in a way, that was nonsense. I mean, they're already asking people if they'd used intravenous drugs, which is, has huge, not only personal, but legal ramifications. Um, and so to ask other uh, history questions that indeed are embarrassing, we do that in medicine all the time, asking embarrassing questions. Nor would the blood banks check donors for hepatitis B, despite evidence that very often it went with AIDS. If they had just tested the blood for uh, hepatitis B infection, would have eliminated 80% uh, or so of uh, individuals at risk of transmitting AIDS. The indecision had fatal consequences. Kenny Jenks is a hemophiliac. Throughout 83, no one told him that his medicine meant he was in danger. I went to the Hemophilia Foundation about 1983, and they did a physical, and it was never once brought up. It wasn't until 1984, 85, when I began seeing television reports about hemophiliacs coming down with uh, AIDS. To make their blood clot properly, hemophiliacs take an expensive medicine called Factor 8. The medicine I take, it takes 2,000 people to make one dose, costing about $1,000. Now, you don't want people that are using this product to stop. There's some monetary incentives there not to let them stop. It seems easy, but we transfuse three to four million people a year. 
If this was a rampant viral disease, why weren't thousands getting sick? And the same was true for hemophilia. Barbara and Kenny Jenks had been childhood sweethearts. Even when he discovered the danger to himself, nobody told him that making love to his wife was dangerous. There was no mention of my wife contracting any disease for me. Sure, I could get it, but nobody sat down and said this disease could be transmitted to your wife through sex. The Haemophiliac's journal carried the advice to lead as normal a life as possible. So there was no discussions about safe sex, no discussions about condoms or abstinence uh, uh, with the hemophiliacs. And as a result, now you have uh, whole families dying and leaving orphan children. One of those to die was Kenny Jenks' wife, Barbara. Her death, years later, was a consequence of the authorities' neglect. They took a wait-and-see attitude. And because of that, uh, 80 to 90 percent of all hemophiliacs are infected with AIDS. The only certain way to avoid such tragedy was to manufacture a test. By the autumn of 1983, the race was on between Washington and Paris to get there first. I believe that rivalry is an important element of the human spirit, and I think it's part of uh, the very nature of the scientific uh, enterprise, as people say. The first task was to find a way to grow the virus. By now, both labs felt sure they'd located the right culprit, but its habit of killing rather than replicating all the cells that came near it baffled everyone. We didn't have good characterization of the virus, neither did they in France. We didn't have any molecular biology, neither did they in France by that time, because we couldn't really extensively produce the virus. One person in the lab had a task of trying to produce it in a cell line. That person was a Czech scientist called Mika Popovic. It was a tense and frustrating autumn for him and the French. Mass producing the virus was a crucial step towards a generally available blood test, and it was important to both labs to be first. The Americans were running tests not only on their own isolates, but also on a couple of samples sent from Paris. They were labelled LAV, the name the French had given their virus. At last, Popovic managed to keep some cells alive, using, as it happened, one of the French isolates. It was a vital breakthrough. He went to the Christmas party in good spirits to tell Bob Gallo, and got clear instructions. He told that we should concentrate ourselves on our own isolate and not uh, to continue to work with LAV. Normal lab practice is to keep each sample separate, but Popovic's next brainwave was to pool several together and try his new technique on them. Gallo approved. I selected three I said, why do you want to, who cares if it comes from a single patient or you put in a pool? I don't care if we can trace the lineage. I don't mean I wouldn't care if I knew that the French guy's virus was in there, because that would have been inappropriate and would get us into a problem. Then one night, Popovic saw that something in the pool had started multiplying furiously. He had beaten the French. He got orders to rush his work into print immediately. I was surprised because the paper needs more work. Second, figures were not ready at that time. I had fear that in the end I don't make it. His draft mentioned LAV in the first paragraph. Gallo told him to demote it. We discussed how to describe LAV, and he suggested that it should be in discussion part and not in introduction. I agreed with it. Gallo's handwritten comments are characteristically forthright. Mika, you are crazy. Mika, I just don't believe it. You are absolutely incredible. They led to the charge that he deliberately minimized the French contribution. It's untrue. What he said was that LAV was temporarily cultured in some cell line. The knowledge I had about LAV was that nothing important happened with it. The work done in Paris and Washington had at last provided the conclusive evidence needed to force the blood banks to act. Don Francis tried to arrange a joint announcement. Well, I asked that there be a meeting of the th three major groups, which is 
Bob Gallo's group, Institute Pasteur and CDC, and we all met in early April at the Institute Pasteur reviewing our data, clearly showing that the, that the virus that the French had discovered a year before was the cause. We viewed all the information from the three labs, and it was a very exciting time. We went out and celebrated at a nightclub. It was all very good. But the story leaked, and suddenly the deal was off. Literally the next thing that happened was an announcement that came through official government channels that the Secretary of Health and Human Services of the United States was going to call a press conference and announce that Bob Gallo discovered the cause of AIDS. The probable cause of AIDS has been found. A variant of a known human cancer virus called HLT HTLV-3. Not only did they do that, but they didn't hardly mention the French. In particular, credit must go to our eminent Dr. Robert Gallo. I had never been at a press conference in my life before that, to the best of my recollection. Certainly nothing like this, where you walk into a room and there's a sea of reporters. Now, if you could do it over again, maybe I should have insisted that the pastor scientists be there at the same time. I call upon Dr. Robert Gallo with applause and appreciation. As Secretary, Secretary Heckler services. had severe laryngitis. She was reading her release. She read halfway through and stopped. The release was available for the whole audience. The release clearly gave full credit to the pastor scientists. If what they identified in science a year ago uh, is the same as what we now have produced more than 50 isolates of, and in mass production and in detailed characterization, if it turns out to be the same, I certainly will say so. I called Gallo before the press conference, asked him to, to mention what uh, we had done. And he called me after the conference saying, oh, everything is over now, it's been, uh, I said what uh, you asked for. But actually, it was not exactly that. There has never been any fights or controversies between us and a group in France. I came back from a meeting astounded to see this kind of discussion. He was caught into this political maelstrom that uh, was generated by the administration making this announcement. Realized this administration was already starting to get criticized appropriately for their inaction on AIDS. And now they had something that they could hang their political hat on. That is that a government laboratory had discovered the cause of AIDS. The fact that it was a year after the discovery by another laboratory seemed to be immaterial to them. The French were very upset because they felt the world was ignoring them. Now, all interest was shifting to this giant, well-funded laboratory in the National Cancer Institute uh, compared to the small laboratory at the uh, Institute Pasteur. So it was a uh, uh, David and Goliath situation that uh, Goliath was winning. What rankled most with the French was that the Americans named the virus HTLV-3. I was really surprised about the, the press conference myself. I really think that was a mistake to call HTLV. So I was really scientifically upset about that. Concerning Bob Gallo, I was not surprised because he still at that time was not convinced completely that it was not HTLV related. So I was not so surprised. I think he's a very bright and intelligent guy and uh, he's a very charming man. Personally, I like him. As a man, uh, I can have uh, dinner with him or go to a party with him with great pleasure. Now, uh, scientifically, today I will be careful about him. It was a question of prestige. You know, the, uh, the United States had spent a lot of money already on that uh, disease and they, they wanted uh, to be the first. But this very exciting time turned out to be a nightmare because suddenly this world of science that I wanted to unify and put forward to a very clear wall to the public was one, split down the middle, and two, now the public had two viruses that caused AIDS. One was called LAV and the other one was called HDLV3.
In an attractive suburb of San Francisco lived the Borschelt family. The grandmother, Frances Borschelt, was always the life and soul of the party. My wife was a very, very outgoing person, a very lovable person, very lovely person. She was perpetual motion, just constantly on the go, always had things to do. She loved to be at parties. My mother loved to polka. My younger brother was getting married and she wanted to be able to dance at his wedding and wanted to enjoy herself. She decided to have a hip operation in time for the wedding. Knowing it might involve a transfusion, her husband listened carefully to what was said about blood safety on television. When someone gives a unit of blood here, it goes through eight different tests, but there's still no way to know for sure if there's AIDS in the blood. But blood bank officials are confident that their blood is safe. I would have no qualms about receiving blood from this blood bank or having anyone that I love receiving blood. Mrs. Borschelt went into hospital in August 1984, four months after the AIDS virus had been announced. When asked if she was willing to have a transfusion, she said no. She didn't like the idea of someone else's blood inside her. In the event, unknown to her family, she was given three pints. Right from the time that they let her out of the hospital, she came home with a fever of 102. She practically, we did, we had to carry her up the stairs. She couldn't walk. She went to her son's wedding, but not to dance. It was a medical encyclopedia of different illnesses. She developed discharges from strange parts of her body. Um, she lost weight. She had night sweats. It was one doc different doctor after the other. The psoriasis made her practically insane to the point of where I wanted to put gloves on her hands to keep her from scratching her body. It looked as if she had been in a fire. Her whole body was completely awash in sores. For over a year, the blood banks had been asking donors to fill in a questionnaire about their sexual history, but it was voluntary. They relied on donors judging for themselves if they thought their blood might be infected. What they were doing was handing them a piece of paper saying there's a new disease. If you've had multiple sexual partners, we ask that you not donate blood. In other words, they were asking the donors to screen themselves. They had abrogated their responsibility as physicians to screen these donors. Mrs. Borschelt's donor didn't complete the form. Funny enough, I don't blame the person who gave it to her. If they were relying on self-deferral, then they should have kept to the strict guidelines. He left a section blank about hepatitis the test or the questioning should have stopped right then and there and clarified it. It didn't. Now, that's how they injured the recipient, because by not taking a proper medical history and eliminating from the blood supply those individuals who might be infected, they transmitted the disease to, it's estimated, between 12 and 15,000 people. As many as 40 more people in the Bay Area may come down with AIDS after being exposed through contaminated blood transfusion. So says it was some months before it began to dawn on Kathy Borschelt that her mother's rapid deterioration was in fact AIDS. Now from Dr. Herbert Perkins. That the risk of getting AIDS from a blood transfusion is extremely small. Your chance of being killed by a car on the way to the hospital are better than your chance of getting AIDS from a blood transfusion. With what was going on in the news and everything that was coming out, Something just clicked, and I had asked my father to ask their family doctor to have her tested for AIDS. She was a lovely lady. Uh, she actually heard that some woman had been infected from a transfusion while she was lying up in the hospital and told her family that day, I've heard on television that there's some woman who's caught AIDS from a transfusion, and the family knew it was her. And only later did she come to learn that it was her. <laughs> If you can picture the life of the party, a person who wants to tell people what to do and how to do it, and then to change completely to almost like an animal, not, not being able to do anything for yourself, having people shun you, it, it just defeated her completely. It took, it took all of her, her life away from her, all of her feeling. 
until she ended up as almost, uh, well, nothing. I was very angry in the beginning at what she had to go through, at the indignities that she had to suffer, the tests that they ran her through for nothing. By then, there had been at least nine transfusion cases. I think the medical establishment is at fault for refusing to listen. I mean, you'd have to be living in a cave not to realize what was going on. As Francis Borschelt lay dying, the drug companies were working on turning the technique evolved in Dr. Gallo's laboratory into a practical blood test. But still, the blood banks refrained from taking decisive action. In the fall of 1984, Abbott Laboratories developed the ELISA test to test to see if blood was infected. And they went to a number of different blood banks around the nation to start using the test to test it, to see how accurate it was. And what they started finding was that there were people coming into those blood banks to give blood who were testing positive. And so as early as October of 1984, the blood bankers knew, based on tests they were doing in their own blood banks, that there were infected people walking in the door. And they did not change what they were doing until that test was licensed on March the 15th, 1985. The test we are licensing today is the answer to the prayers of thousands of Americans facing surgery or otherwise requiring blood. It is designed to screen blood. It should have been a moment of pure satisfaction for American science, a vital end product from costly theoretical research. But their triumph had already turned sour. The questions multiplied about alleged irregularities in Bob Gallo's lab, as the French became increasingly bitter at what they saw as inadequate recognition of their achievements. I think the history is clear cut. The first isolation of a virus later shown to be the AIDS virus, was at the Pasteur Institute. The compelling evidence that convinced the scientific community that this kind of virus is the cause of AIDS came from us. The proper growth of the virus came from this laboratory, principally through Mika Popovic. The development of a sensitive, workable blood test, I don't think we have to debate. I think the history speaks for itself of where blood tests were done and lives were saved. It was too late, though, to save Francis Borscheld. In June 1985, her condition had deteriorated, and her family were asked to come quickly to the hospital. She was in coma, she was blind, and I kept telling her to let go. There was no way that I, I, I could have let it go on any longer, and I kept saying, Mom, it's okay, it's okay, go. And she was stubborn till the last. They all left the hospital, and as soon as they left, she died. She felt that it would be better if she did it without us there. It was the very day the blood test was finally put on the market. In the early days, I'd sit and I'd look at a chair and I'd just wish that I could see her. I, I, I don't wish that anymore. But uh, there's a constant hole and there's nothing else that can fill it. She made an impact on all of our lives. If there were ever two people who were really in love with each other, it was my mother and father. I lost my right hand, my left hand. And in fact, I, I lost my reason for living in, in a certain way. By the time the blood test came on the market, only a few cases of AIDS had been confirmed in Africa. One of the first to react was a surgeon called Anne Bailey. She'd heard reports from Uganda of a fatal new disease, which the locals called SLIM, and decided to investigate. She arrived at Masaka Hospital with some colleagues from Kampala. Masaka was the main town in the region near Lake Victoria, where the unexplained deaths had been reported two years before. 
We went into the hospital and Masaka Hospital was pretty grim. It was depressed. Some patients have been singled out for examination, but Anne Bailey's eye was drawn to other people in the ward. My Ugandan colleague settled down to question and examine those patients, and I had nothing particular to do, so I wandered off down the ward with the usual clinical curiosity to see what was, what was there. By the time I reached the end of the ward, I thought there was a, a good deal more slim there. She was shocked by the condition to which the patients had been reduced. Eventually, people get too weak to sit up, too weak to walk. Their memories fail. Their speech and actions become very slow. Their facial expression is lost. It becomes a blank. Anne Bailey kept bringing extra patients and even their visitors to be tested, to the surprise of Dr. Roy McGerwer. We had mixed feelings. I remember talking to some of my colleagues when we looked at Anne Bailey sort of going into the trouble of taking history and examining some of the patients whom we didn't think uh, had anything wrong with them and uh, we were wondering why. We documented the history, the physical findings and we took blood and this blood was sent to UK. Uh, the test for HIV at that time had just been discovered. The virus was being referred to as HTLV-3, not HIV as we know it now. Anne Bailey sent her blood samples to London, 110 of them in all. They were analysed there by Dr Robin Weiss, a leading British scientist who ironically had been showing the French how to mass produce the virus for their own blood test. Robin Weiss found Anne Bailey's instinct had been entirely accurate. Not only the cases picked out by the hospital, but all the other people she'd brought in for testing were infected with the AIDS virus. There was no reason to associate any of the cases with homosexuality. We were able to show that slim disease was nothing other than AIDS, and that those people, and many of their still healthy uh, uh, relatives in that area, uh, were infected with HIV. It was our first real insight into the uh, high prevalence of HIV in Africa, transmitted heterosexually. Dr. David Sawada had also been on the trip to Masaka Hospital. This was an eye-opener because we thought this was not our problem, it was out in white homosexuals. And the lesson here was uh, it was here, and from what we could gather, it was a big epidemic already. I was very frustrated, and the health officials were very reluctant to accept this. The political situation didn't help either. It took like five years, really, everybody to realize that the disease is here. And I believe, I have no doubt in my mind, during that time, the epidemic really grew out of hand. I felt completely overwhelmed by it. I couldn't get those young people out of my mind. I couldn't get out of my mind the significance of about a quarter of all the people we'd seen being HIV infected. And they reminded me of the photographs of victims from the Holocaust concentration camps at the end of the 39-45 war. They were mostly in their middle 20s. They were apathetic with a haunted, glazed expression on their faces, and they were quite helpless. It's a very lonely way to die, and some of them go on so long. Dementia and death. The tragedy of AIDS in Africa was just unfolding. Who knows AIDS? Nobody knows. Abana, you can't even know AIDS. Legs not good at all. I wanted a tablet of peritone to kill myself, not to go into heaven. 
I was appalled by the squalor of dying in that way, the squalor of their helplessness, the poverty of the circumstances I'd seen. And I wanted some way of dignifying their deaths. I longed for music, poetry, something which would restore to them some of their human dignity. But it would be over a year before any government anywhere in the world took decisive action.